faster and more intense. That was his main direction. He just wanted us to speed through it. George is notorious for saying, after a take, you know, do it again, faster, more intensity. He certainly said to me, it was, you know, it's terrific, tonic, and he do it again faster. But that's it, I didn't get more intensity. I didn't think 3 PO with more intensity would be bearable, do you? Mm. <laughs> Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Faster and More Intense. Uh, I'm your host, Shiloh Camrath, and joining me, as he does always, is my co-host, Mr. George Costell. Hello once again, dear friends. So, George, do you realize the significance of this episode? Uh, I think I know what you're going for, but how about you just tell us so I don't look like an idiot? Alright, uh, the significance of this episode is that it is it is episode 20. Yay. Ah, I was Although right. Although it's not truly even episode 20 because we did that whole thing a while back where we started recounting again. So it's probably closer to like episode 60. But, hey, who's counting? I mean, hey, 20, 20 past the recount. You know, yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah, not bad. It reminds me of, uh... so you remember the movie Pacific Rim? Of how can I forget Pacific Rim? I love that movie. You really did I love that movie? I have Guillermo del Toro's autograph on a picture of him behind the scenes. On okay, it. well, I was just about to trash talk the <laughs> That's entire a true movie. true story. But I'm not going to do that. I mean, I mean, the movie is like halfway garbage. Uh, okay. I mean, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, but whenever I always hear about, you know, like resetting something, I always think about uh, that clock that they had in there that they would reset every yeah. time. <laughs> a new monster would spawn or something. Oh, <laughs> uh, that movie was something. But, uh, eh, whatever. I mean, it, it said it would be giant robots fighting giant monsters, and uh, it was, for the most part. Yeah, it, it seems like something that, like, he thought up when he was, like, a little kid. He's like, this would be awesome. I'm going to make a movie about oh, it. Oh, it's. And I like, mean, it was, it was 100% like a tribute to, like, Godzilla and all those old kaiju movies he grew up with. Uh, it was like a passion project. Yeah, uh, yeah, a passion project that costed what, probably a hundred million dollars. Yeah, it was uh, at least. Yeah, it was an insanely expensive movie. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're getting off topic. This is a Star Wars podcast, not yeah. Pacific we're getting Rim, off topic as much as I wish yeah. it was. <laughs> oh well. Um, uh, but uh, so we are not going to be having a second podcast this week. Uh, we're just going to be doing uh, this today. Uh, we have a ton of news to talk about, as well as the f second issue of Poe Dameron, uh, which was quite a little delightful comment comic in itself. S but before yeah. we get into that, uh, George, what do we have for news this week? Well, I think we should probably open up with what's probably the biggest piece of news. Um, and uh, this hasn't been explicitly confirmed by uh, Lucasfilm. Uh, but according to a bunch of insiders, enough to the like enough sources are reporting on this, where I think most people are viewing it as fact. Uh, Alden Ehrenreich, I hope is how you pronounce his name, has been cast as the new Han Solo in a Phil Lord and Chris Miller spin-off movie. Um, and so I don't know about you, this is not a movie I'm excited for, really. Um, it's not a movie I think should be made. Uh, but that said, I think they've done a good job at least putting pretty talented pieces into it. I like Phil Lord and Chris Miller. Um, and Alden Ehrenreich was actually uh, among the frontrunners listed, one of my favorites. Um, so I'm, I'm not, like, too broken up over the news uh, in a sort of best-of-the-bad situation sort of way. I don't know how you feel. I'm more, like, extremely and exquisitely indifferent um, because I have never heard of Alden Ehrenreich before. Um, but yeah, like you, I don't, I'm not necessarily excited for this movie. I don't necessarily think it should be even being made either. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. I mean, if anything, if there's a Han Solo movie I'd like to see, it's what happened to Han Solo after episode six. That's what I, that, you know, I would rather watch that movie than I would, you know, this. But, well, you know, it's a Star Wars movie coming out. We're going to go see it. I think that's pretty much a guarantee. And yeah. if, if, you know, if they, do, yeah. if they do make a good acting choice for it, you know, that's better. That's something. Yeah, exactly. I mean, call me a sucker, but if they release a Star Wars movie on the big screen, no matter what it's about, I'm going to go see it. 
it could literally be called Jar Jar's Big Adventure, and I'd still probably be grudgingly go in and <laughs> shell over my ten bucks to get a ticket. Well, remember, uh, Eric, I've I've brought up this famous quote he's had several times. Um, it, what is it? Star Wars: The Lonely Space Slug. Yes, and we would go yeah. see that film gladly. I mean, that could be like I don't know. Can you mention like a nature documentary, sort of like Werner Herzog? Yeah. You know, just really sparse. That could be interesting. Mm. I'd, I'd you could have, that, like, some imperial obviously. officer, you know, with his, just, like, narrating, you know, the the, the uh, space slug and its natural habitat. Yeah. I'd watch the crap out of that. I think so. It'd be a fun thing to watch, actually. Probably pretty relaxing. Yeah. But who knows. Um, other news this week? Uh, a few things went down on Star Wars Day. Uh, one of them being the announcement of the next celebration, uh, and it's returning to Orlando. Mm. Um, Star Wars celebrations going back to Orlando, April thirteenth through sixteenth, twenty seventeen. Uh, tickets are going on sale Wednesday, May twenty fifth, at noon Pacific time. Uh, and so I was actually thinking to myself, I actually went to Celebration Four, um, back in two thousand seven. And so this will be a decade since my last celebration. Uh, and I think it's going to have to get me to go back for that. Well, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty disappointed. I was hoping it was going to be coming to Eugene, Oregon. Uh, like, because <laughs> I, I totally would have gone, you know. But uh, I'm still, I, I'm just wishing they could go to the Javits Center, you know. Like if New York Comic Con can pull in you know, 100,000 people, I don't know why they can't get celebration over there. Uh, yeah. Um. What, the, the one thing that really bums me out on a serious note um, is that 2017, obviously, is going to have the 40th anniversary of A New Hope. Mm, oh, yeah, um, 1977, you're right. And, yeah, and that's a big deal. That was, like, the big deal behind Celebration 4. Because, um, you know, the first few celebrations were done to coincide with the release of the prequels. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, obviously, the most recent one can build hype for Episode 7. Uh, but Celebration 4 was done specifically to celebrate A New Hope's 30th anniversary. Ah. Um, what was 5 and, and there 6 they sk- done for, then? They they were tied to the 30th anniversaries for Empire and Return of the Jedi. Oh, they were, like, oh, heavily okay. themed that way. Oh, that makes sense. Um, I think they were ever They should have been every... I know 5 was 2010. I think Celebration 6 was 2013 as well. Um, but certainly that's what their themes were either way. Um... But here, you know, with uh, with Celebration 4, they were smart enough to have the celebration over Memorial Day weekend. So you actually had the exact 30th anniversary be covered by the convention. Um, and because they're doing April 13th through 16th here, that's not what's going to happen. Uh, which I think is kind of disappointing. Um, but, you know, it happens. What are you going to do? Yeah. Call up somebody at Lucasfilm and complain, I suppose. Yeah, I don't know how well that'll go for me. Um, but what do you know? Speaking of call up someone at Lucasfilm, I completely forgot about this. Um, but I don't know if you know Andy Gutierrez, um, you know who does Rebels Recon. She back at C two E two did an, made an appearance on uh, NPR's radio game Ask Me Another. Um, and Are part you, of that wait, segment on. was... Ask, Is it Ask Me Another or Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me? Ask okay. Me Another. Um, and so some of that segment was actually just released. Um, so it was uh, actually about Star Wars parody Twitter accounts. Um, so go give that a listen. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Veer's Watch, not mentioned, which is just as good because Veer's Watch's work isn't a joke. <laughs> yeah. So, well, was the emo Kylo Ren one mentioned? Of was, course. Okay. How could it not well, be? Well, I was just checking. I mean, the, well, let's see. There's that <laughs> one. There's the Darth Vader one, I think, is pretty big, too. And then Lone... Very Vader Lonely Lone Luke, Luke showed up. Um, a Han showed up. I think some sort of Vader account showed up. Um, I think there's a depressed Darth, yeah. and then there's... And then just a straight-up Darth Vader. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know if they gave the handle for that one. I think they might have just done the character. Yeah. Um, but the other ones, yeah, they gave uh, the actual uh, account. And so it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, so check that out. Um, 
you can just Google Andy Gutierrez, uh, and it's actually, at least when I did, the top result. Um, so, have fun with that. Um, other news, uh, also on Star Wars Day, um, StarWars.com finally released um, the audio for uh, Jabba Flow, the cantina theme from The Force Awakens. Um, hmm. So, you know, that's the music that's playing in uh, Maz's castle when, uh, you know, you they first walk in. Um, and that was not composed by John Williams. It was actually done by uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, who's, you know, uh, if you don't know, wrote the musical Hamilton that's currently on Broadway. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and so he and J.J. Abrams actually on Star Wars Day gave a live performance of it. <laughs> Outside the theater for Hamilton, which was delightful. I'm really bitter I didn't know that was coming, because I totally would have gone. Um, but they released it. He actually gave an interview and said um, that the, he actually like researched the meaning of the lyrics in Hatties. Um, so that, I think, is a lot of fun. Um, there's some album art to go along with it, kind of Moz, just Raven. Um, it's, it's a lot of so fun. So wait, there's like the um, words of that song actually mean something? Yes, they do. Um, Is it like an ode to it's dead Jabba or something? Uh, I think... Mm, according to Manuel, the song's lyrics, at least at one point, translate to, No, lover, lover, it wasn't me. Uh, so, it's it's all over the place. It's like, it's just an, an ode to Jabba, more or less. <laughs> um, but yeah... Go go on YouTube, do yourself a favor, listen to Java Flow. It's a lot of fun. It's only about two minutes. Um, but it's nice that it's finally out after not being included on the initial soundtrack album. Um, then, let's see. One last piece of uh, news that came from Star Wars Day. Uh, Funko unveiled the uh, finished models for their next wave of Pops. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a... Of note, I think, is they're finally doing a Luke Skywalker from Episode 7. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, with his uh, his silver hand there or whatever. Yeah. And to my knowledge, this might actually be, like, the first Luke Skywalker Episode 7 collectible. Because I don't think he's got an he action He hasn't got an SA um, Black Series figure yet? He hasn't gotten a 3 3 quarter. He hasn't gotten a Black Series. He hasn't gotten Wait, anything. Wait, I thought that he had a um, figure that came out, like, long before the movie came out and all that. Wow. No. Hmm. That's surprising, actually. Yeah, well, I mean, bear in mind, they were trying to keep his appearance under wraps until the movie came out. Um, which is why, like, we didn't get any official release. There was only, like, a leaked picture of him. Um, so there was that. Uh, but then there's a bunch of other stuff coming out. Some of it's just, you know, minor background characters. Um, some of my favorites from the wave... Uh, there's FN2199, Traitor. Um, they're doing three different Ray Pops. Three different ones? And let's see, I want to see if you can guess, because bear in mind, they've already done a regular one and one with her goggles on. So I want to see if you can figure out the three that they have here. Um, let's see, all right. There's going to be one with her wearing Finn slash Poe's jacket. No, actually. Wow, okay. Um, There's going to be one... She wears the same outfit the entire movie. Uh, There's going to be one with her holding a lightsaber out. Uh, Yeah, well, um, there's at least one of those, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, let me just clarify. I'll give you the two. All right. There's one with her, like, lightsaber ignited when she's dueling Kylo. Um, and then there's also her in her final outfit, which is different from her outfit in the rest of the movie, BT Dubs. It is? Um, I was holding the lightsaber out to Luke, unignited. No, it's not. It's different. Um, if you look at, like, a side-by-side shot, it's uh, pretty obvious. Huh. Um, similar, but she has, like, a little extra jacket on top. Um, but, yeah, so one with the lightsaber ignited, one with her giving the lightsaber to Luke. And I would be amazed if you guessed the last one. Do you want me to just give it to you? <sighs> give me one guess. Um... It is. There's already one with her with her staff, right? Yeah, I think that's the basic okay. one. Uh, 
okay, I give up. It's her wearing the rebel pilot helmet, holding her little uh, oh, X-wing pilot doll. Oh, that's actually not a bad one. Huh. Which is, yeah, it's not like, as I noted with my buddy John, uh, you could literally have a legit collection of pops just by buying their ray variants. Because uh, I think by my count, there's like five of them. Um, that's kind of a smart marketing idea, uh, to an extent. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of like I don't know. From a, it doesn't make much sense to me other than a marketing. Like, why not just make the one pop figure and then have a removable helmet, the lightsaber be removable, the staff be removable. Well, I mean the I mean th- that's not what they do with pops though. They're meant to be more like statues or bobbleheads than anything. Yeah. Um, so like the display options are very limited. I don't think they've. They might have done one with a removable helmet. I think the NFL ones have removable helmets, but that's, like, it. Um, I mean, you're right. If, if it was, like, Hasbro doing it, yeah, it would be pretty cool of them to, you know, include the X-Wing pilot helmet and the doll and then the lightsaber and the staff. Um, but that's not the way well, Hasbro works. Um, Poe is getting a few variants. Um, him in the jacket early on is a Hot Topic exclusive. Him in the orange pilot jumpsuit without the vest is an FYE exclusive. Speaking Maz of that is coming. Jacket, I, I just mm-hmm. want to make a prediction here for episode 8. Every major character mm-hmm. will end up wearing the jacket at some point before they're gone out of the movie. So you think it's going to go two for two? The jacket? I mean, yeah. I mean, it got Finn, Poe, and Rey in the first one. Yeah, I think, I think Luke's going to wear it at some point. I think Leia's <laughs> going to wear it at some point. I think any new characters we're going to get are going to wear it. I think even Kylo Ren is going to throw it on at some point. <laughs> and like nice the jacket. jacket will replace R2D2 and C3PO as the st- <laughs> as the thing that stays, you know, from movie to movie, you know, they've never changed. The jacket is going to be what's what's that? Yeah. Well, I can dig it. Um but yeah, all those pops are coming out I think in the summer. Uh, I don't know if they gave an exact uh July. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um so uh, you can take a look at them all at StarWars.com. I've included a bunch of them in the video, so have fun with that. Uh, last thing I have to talk about real quick. Um, I don't want to get too into it. Does it have to do with EA? Because um, Claude... I might have seen this. No, actually. So if you have something with EA, you go after me. Um, but Claudia Gray did an interview with StarWars.com about Bloodline. Um, and Pablo Hidalgo actually talked about it on Twitter as well. Um, I'm not going to get too into that because I think we should save it for our Bloodline cast coming next week. Um, but if you don't want to wait till then, just check out Pablo Hidalgo's Twitter or StarWars.com and you can see these interviews and tidbits from behind the scenes. All right. Uh, speaking of, have you gotten Bloodlines in yet? Well, I already finished it. You finished it already? Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> I haven't even gotten it yet. <laughs> I ordered it like oh, wow. what a, what, what a two square. days ago. Okay, um, well, good thing I can read fast, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, I believe uh, Paul is going to be joining us for that. He, uh, he's joined us for most of the new, most of the novels that have come out, uh, including Lost Stars, so he will be back with us, uh, and we will discuss Bloodlines. Uh, but, so the thing about EA, um, as I was quickly perusing some of the news this week, uh, before the show, I had seen that someone was talking about how EA has plans to make a third-person Star Wars um, adventure game. That yeah, that I should have mentioned. Um, yes, go on. That's it. That's all. I that's all I read about it. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I don't know too much, but I believe I saw. I'm assuming it's the same game that the makers of Titan. Yes. Yeah, that was mentioned. Uh, yeah, are going to be doing a Star Wars game. Um, so yeah, you're you're right. I should have mentioned that. That was announced on Star Wars at well, but it wasn't on StarWars.com. I remember offhand, um, so I forgot about it. But yes, that is another thing that is coming. Uh, very exciting. Should be quite fun. So do you imagine this so is going to be similar to a kind of a Knights of the Old Republic style game? Um, my hunch is probably going to be more along the lines of like Uncharted. Um, or like what Star Wars 1313 would have been. Um. It doesn't sound like you didn't say role playing game. You said action adventure, right? Uh, what'd you say? It's you didn't say you said a, it's going to be action adventure. That's right? what Not I had playing. read in that little snippet. Yeah. Yeah. So Kotor is definitely more role playing than action adventure. Mm. Um, 
So I'd expect, like I said, something like Uncharted. Assuming I know um, what Uncharted is, so sure. <laughs> I, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. That. I can look it up after the cast. Well, I mean, did you see any of the stuff for, like, 1313? I think I saw a trailer long, long time ago. I remember it was basically you were going to be, like, this criminal or somebody in the criminal underworld of on level yeah 13, it's, it's the same genre it's the same genre mm-hmm. is what i'm driving at yeah so no rpg style build your character it's gonna be you just have a character now go adventurize uh that would be my assumption um i mean i'm sure there'll be like some character building but it's not going to be i think you know like the central component of the game mm-hmm. um but who knows they could prove me wrong yep it's EA. I mean, um, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that's fair. Um, all right, well, that's all I had in terms of news. Um, I don't know if you had anything else. Uh, no, probably, I think the only thing I had to add was the uh, EA thing. All right, uh, well then, let's get into Ho Dameron, issue number two. Um... And, you know, last time we talked about Poe Dameron, I think we kind of agreed that uh, it was going to be very much like a place-setting issue. Mm -hmm. Um, And I kind of stated my belief that we'd have to wait at least until the second issue to see just the true nature of the comic, how much we'd enjoy it. Uh, And I don't know about you, but I thought the second issue was a lot more fun than the first. Yep. Um, But I would want to hear you talk at length about it, so go ballistic. Uh, well, before I start, I think I had said something about how the second, uh, that the dude on the second issue looks unbelievably cool. I think I had said something yeah. to that extent, uh, and he mm-hmm. he is very much unbelievably cool, um, and automatically, I really am enjoying his character, and I can't wait to see what they go with it. Um, but, uh, overall, yeah, it was a pretty solid issue, uh. It was it was really fun. I mean, it was just mm-hmm. it seemed fun for fun's sake, you know, to where it was just it was a good story, but yet it still had you know it was just the Darth you know like the Darth Vader series and stuff like that. It's a little more I don't know serious if you want to call a comic serious. Um, whereas this, it was just like a really fun story that you could just you know I don't know hard to describe, but like like I think. Very much like sort of a rollicking adventure. Yeah, yeah. Sort of deal. You know, and it was just, and it's also what's really cool about it is we're getting some other bits of information about how the First Order works, how the galaxy kind of looks and feels. I absolutely am loving the Cold War style feel to this, where, and yeah. not only that, but it is so awesome because it's so close to the news. Do you remember about a wee, two weeks ago? Um, there was the news a some Russian fighter jets were buzzing some of our uh, planes in the Baltic, I believe. What was it? They did a, a barrel roll yeah, of yeah. or something? Yeah, real close, like within 10 yards of the ship. Uh, a MiG just flew right right over one of our uh, destroyers, I think. Um, and here, yeah. same exact thing. It's amazing. An A-wing over their, basically their little carrier thing, buzzes the carrier, flies mm-hmm. right next to it, and the pilots look at each other like, hey, should we do this? He's like, nah, just leave it be. I love oh. that. I lost it at that panel. It just the was... casualness of the pilots. Yeah, it was incredible. I mean, in. it was great. It really had a Cold War feel, and it was just... It, and what's great about that is that's so... It just feels real. It feels right. It feels exactly mm-hmm. like something that would happen in the real world, and, you know, like said, it just did happen. You know, so I I really really like that bit. Um, I have a feeling that of you know one of my issues with uh, Force Awakens was kind of the logistics of the First Order and how they fit into the galaxy and how all this works and whatnot. Um, but you know, if this is kind of how we are going to be seeing the First Order and the um, Resistance relationship, you know, prior to Force Awakens going forward, I am really really excited to see this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you're right. It's a lot of fun. Like the fact that they have orders not to like um, fire upon shooting first is a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and then yeah, I'm with you. Uh, this new guy, Agent Terex, I believe it is. Um, he is a lot of fun. I agree with you. Um, and you know, uh, 
one of the things that we kind of noted was that with the First Order especially, uh, they're going for a very much like of a space Nazi sort of aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, especially if you say, look at um, uh, The Force Awakens, scenes like the rally with Hux. Yeah. They essentially, like the Stormtroopers essentially do Nazi salutes. Yeah. Um, Close face. Like they totally. Open, but hey, whatever. Yeah. Ass- I mean, it's essentially, yeah, the same thing. So they're really playing into that aesthetic. And then they kind of eschew it with this guy, Terex, mm-hmm. um, who, you know, reminded me more of like a World War One sort of flying ace. Um, yeah, the Red Baron. You know, a little more. Yeah, the Red Baron. I mean, with the pencil mustache, I actually thought a little more British. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right. In terms of attitude, he's definitely more of a bad guy sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's, you know, dashing. He. All right, I'm no. You lost it. I did too. He owns oh. Tarkin's ship. He has the Carrion Spike, which was a great tie-in. I that, loved that. That was incredible. I, I and actually, so I was reading this last night, and as soon as I saw that, I flipped out and sent Georgia a Skype message. You know, like, what is this? The Carrion Spike is in this book. That was so. That was, oh, it was so awesome to see because I absolutely love the book Tarkin, and uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm really glad they brought that back. Um, and so then he uses slaves, um, but it looks like he treats them at least halfway decently. Hmm. Um, I mean, I guess he never even refers to them. I mean, he says the Empire kept slaves, um, but he never actually calls them that. He, you know, refers to them as my friends, um, Mm -hmm. condescendingly perhaps, maybe, maybe not. I mean, it looks like they're just kind of lounging around, one of them serving him a drink, so maybe he is more of a slave, um. Uh, interesting situation mm-hmm. either way um yeah i don't i don't think it takes then, much uh uh to figure out at least what a couple of them were there for that was uh <laughs> yeah, yeah that is uh very true um so i mean obviously he's not a great guy um but he's definitely not you know the sort of traditional imperial villain mm-hmm. which makes for a nice change of pace yeah um and w- one of the things Oh. Well, I, I was just going to say, along with the traditional villain, he has, I think, probably the greatest line in this issue, and that is when Captain Phasma says, we are not the Empire, we are, you know, renewed, we're strengthened by the crucible of yada, 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 you know what the party line is. He's yeah. like, yeah, of course not, as he's sipping a drink. Um, Yeah, we're not the Empire, but maybe one day we can hope to be. So, you know, he really does look yeah. back on the Empire and its decadence and its kind of complacency with a little bit of nostalgia. You know, I don't think... He's in it just to be an evil dude. He's in it because he wants to lounge around and have a nice little life, and, you know, that's what the Empire gave him. I think that's some of it, certainly. I mean, he talked about he used to be a stormtrooper. Um, Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's a guy who's been around the block for a while, which is fun. Um, And this is something I want to get too far into, because they actually talk about it in Bloodlines. And since you haven't read, I don't want to spoil it. Um... But, I mean, in there, there are definitely people who have a sense of nostalgia, at least for the sense of order the Empire provided, mm-hmm. um, if not, you know, the corruption that went along with it. Uh, so seeing him kind of play on that nostalgia was fun. And then the other thing that I really enjoyed, um, a small detail, but some of the characters in Bloodlines actually collect Imperial memorabilia. Mm-hmm. Um, there's actually one of the big scenes in the novel is uh, one of the characters going to purchase a... Um, a royal guard helmet from a private collector. Um, and so then actually on the Carrion Spike, you see that uh, Agent Terex actually has a collection of Imperial memorabilia. You can see a Biker Scout helmet, a Stormtrooper helmet, um, you know, a few other helmets that I can't place, uh, you know, various guns. So I thought that was a lot of fun, a nice little yeah. tie-in there. Um, and, you know, obviously you don't want to spoil Bloodlines, but I could totally see, you know, in the First Order, like... Or you know, in the sympathizers, you know, your uh, your devotion to the cause is measured by how many of these you know relics you can f- you have in your collection of the old empire or something, you know. And that, yeah, that's not at all where they're at in Bloodlines, yeah, but, but that's okay. I don't. Know. It sounds like a cool idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then again, um, there's a direct reference to uh, another novel. Um, Phasma references before the Awakening, and it gets a little nod. Uh, I haven't read it, so I can't comment on it too much, but that's always fun to see. They did the same thing with uh, Kanan Mm -hmm. uh, when they brought in um, Ray Sloan, so that was fun. 
Uh, then just seeing Phasma at all was, I thought, pleasant, because she did not get much to do in The Force Awakens. So letting her interact with uh, Terex here is quite fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, w- one thing we talked about is, you know, the difference between believing the party line and just repeating the party line. You know, the, the old, the Empire, you know, your generals and your, you know, admirals were very just, yeah, 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 whatever, the... the the Empire, they, you know, they didn't believe this stuff. They just, you know, kind of repeated it. Uh, here it seems like, you know, Phasma, Hux, they really do believe the doctrine of the First Order. Yeah, um, I, I wouldn't want to read too much into saying that they don't believe it. Because um, I think Lost Stars certainly paints a picture that some don't, but I think at the same time many of them do. I mean, just look at Nash there. Well, I, um, I'm talking more the upper, the you know, the top of the... You know, the top generals and admirals. Obviously, some of, you know, the lower ranks definitely believed it. You know, I think it's mentioned the Stormtrooper Corps, you know, worshipped Darth Vader almost. So, you know, obviously mm-hmm. the lower ranks believed it. But definitely in the in the Empire, you know, we're given the impression that most of them are very corrupt, very, you know, seek only for their own power. You know, just look at, uh, you know, Twilight Company, the Imperial Governors and Generals there, or Lords of the Sith, or, you know, any of them. They don't believe in the mm-hmm. efficiency or the empire. They just believe in, you know, how much they can get for themselves, how quickly. Well, I mean, I'll give you the governor in Twilight Company, but I'd say the two imperial officers hunting her in their own way are very devoted to the empire's ideals. Um, but that's kind of getting us off the topic of the comic. Um, so, I mean, I think the main thing, there's other stuff to talk about, obviously. Um, but, I, I mean, obviously the big addition to the canon and you know, the series here is Terex. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's certainly a character I want to learn more about. Um, cause he talks about doing this work before Phasma was born. Um, so I think, I mean, I didn't think he looked that old here, but you have to imagine he's going to be what in his like fifties, probably maybe at least. And then, um, it looks like they're setting us up for some kind of reveal because, he says, you know, when are you going to, how many times am I going to succeed before you stop telling me to fail? And Phasma says, uh, we all know where you came from, that's why we keep telling you, or something along those lines. So Exactly. You have to mention, I mean, after, you know, being um, a stormtrooper, as he talks about early on, you know, he must have done something, uh, you know, after that, you know, of import in the Empire. Mm-hmm. So it'll be curious to see what happens. Uh, just for a point of reference, uh, Gwendolyn Christie, who you know plays Phasma, she's 37. I um, mean, obviously Phasma doesn't need to be the same age as her, uh, but I, I think it's probably fair to assume that they're going for Phasma as like someone in her mid 30s. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So I, I'd say mid 50s to 60 even for Terex. Um, maybe mid 50s. I would safe. say mid 50s. I I mean I could even see him. Well, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it again, say, it could have been hyperbole. It does say Phasma rose through the ranks, right, in the visual dictionary? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could be hyperbole, since he said before she was born. Yeah. Um, maybe she was. I, I'm just glad he didn't reference space diapers. <laughs> that is uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, thank, thank God for small blessings. Yes. Uh, Poe Dameron is many things. Uh, it is not aftermath. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did we just have a moment of silence um, for aftermath there? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, Poe Dameron. Um, how about we talk about Poe Dameron in the comic Poe Dameron? I was actually about to, um, because I loved his scene, um, where you know he first reveals himself to Terex, um. And, you know, he and Tarek have this little back and forth, um, and Tarek says, you know, it seems like I have all the leverage. And Poe has this really great scene of just, like, you know, narrating about the squadron up top, about what they're going to do, him getting leverage, um, you know, destroying this thing. I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, and it shows Poe's confidence. And then um, Tarek's... And, you know, that he's smart. And then, yeah, immediately Tarek turns the table on him. And then Tarek's is like, like oh, dude... Calm down. We're gonna have an omelet, okay? And then, yeah, <laughs> that was also a pretty funny line. Yeah, flame troopers showing up actually get something to do. Yeah. 
They start roasting that big cosmic egg sort of thing. Uh, it looks like we get a new ship type again. Uh-huh. Um, a Maxima A class heavy cruiser, which looks pretty snazzy. Love that design. It's got the uh, the conning tower off to the side, like an aircraft carrier. Pretty cool. Yeah, I was going to say that's what it reminded me of. That was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and just a bunch of Tie Fighters coming in. So uh, who knows? We could wind up losing one of our pilots next issue. Um. But yeah, lots of fun, this issue. I, I like that. We don't get too much more information about that damn egg, um, but it looks like it's in trouble. Yeah. So that's too bad. Yeah, I just, I don't know what's up with this egg. I hope they can tie it in in some meaningful way, or maybe tie it into something existing, but I, it'd be kind of funny if it just turns out to be like a complete hoax, and the thing is nothing after all, but... I don't think it's going to be that. That would be, like, really amusing <laughs> to have these people who actually care for this strange, mysterious thing, and it turns out they're, they are, in fact, just as crazy as they seem. Yeah, like, the egg is literally just a giant chicken, and he w- and Terex was totally serious when he said they were going to have an omelet. <laughs> who knows? Um, other things I enjoyed... Uh, we get some new Stormtrooper variants with the jump packs. It looks like they... I didn't realize before, but it looks like they have a um, like a little chest box on them. Kind of like a TIE pilot, which is fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually got my hopes up, unduly so. Because uh, Terex is riding a speeder in this issue at the start. Um, and I was really hoping. It looked for a second kind of like Hasbro actually did like a little mini rig speeder um, that came out with The Force Awakens. And it was in this, like, black and red color scheme. Mm-hmm. And I was hoping that, like, it, like the comic was actually canonizing it and not just making it a Hasbro creation. Mm. Um, but it's a different speeder. And the speeder so, kind of uh, looks like a bark speeder, too, doesn't it? Yeah, it's definitely got some bark speeder influences because um, it's like kind of got bigger in back. But the front reminds me more of a traditional Imperial speeder. Um but like then the very fins at the very front are different, um, so it's it's all over the place. Yeah. Uh, interesting speeder, not what they made an action figure version of, and that is a shame. Um, but I still want a Terex action figure. Yeah. And I would imagine like you would that. get one because uh, I I think they're probably going to keep this comic around for a while. Yeah, but I mean, they have. Here's the thing: they haven't done any uh, action figures based off the new comics to, yet. They haven't. To done... be fair, though, Disney is at Hasbro and Lucasfilm. They are pivoting towards the sequel trilogy hard. So that the fact that they they're not making um, action figures about you know stuff that happens in the quote unquote past in the Star Wars chronology chronology doesn't surprise me that much. On the one hand, yes, but on the other, this year I think it's going to be very light on sequel trilogy stuff. It's going to be all Rogue One, um, in terms of merchandise at least. Uh, so we'll see. Terex will have to last through that, I guess, to uh, stand a chance maybe. Yeah. Either that or I'm sure you'll, there'll be some customizers who will make him, and uh, you could probably put in an order there. Oh, yeah. I, I'm sure I could, yes. Um, but all, all in all, he's just a very fun character. Um, and like we said, very much not an Imperial that we would come to expect. Not stodgy. Um, mm. Very fun. Almost flamboyant in a way. Charismatic, um, definitely. Definitely charismatic. Um, One thing that struck me so I, I, was... Oh, go, yeah. Was, uh, you know, we have our examples of... You know, Imperial officers not caring about their men. Callus kicking a stormtrooper in the face to his death. All this kind of stuff. He seems to actually have a genuine care for his men. And if not care, at least uh, places a sense of value on them. Which is really interesting uh, to see that. Because, I don't know, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean... Uh, yeah, I, and you wonder how much of that's because he rose through the ranks. Um, you know, he says he used to be a stormtrooper. So, I mean, if that's your background, you're going to have a respect for that. Yeah. So who knows? 
Uh, but uh, like we said, he's a lot of fun, and I look forward to seeing him and Poe continue to face off in the future. Um, you know, the ne- the cover for the next issue has all Poe's pilots on it, um, so it looks like they might take on an even more active role, getting into some shenanigans. Um, but that's a month out from the day of recording, so uh, yeah. we have some time to wait. I do have one complaint, though. Do they mm-hmm. have to be the best star pilots in the galaxy? Yes, he specifically assembled the squadron, like to be the best. Yeah, but it, I but mean, I mean and it's and it's post it's post saying that's that true. I best. mean, but the Doesn't resistance the only has car. like a hundred people in it. I mean, come on, they're really the best. Well, he, he's. I mean, obviously, he's not going to say, "Oh, you guys have the best pilots." <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. But I mean, if you look at it this way, Poe has handpicked, you know, say the five best pilots in the Resistance to be in the squadron, and uh, Terex probably has just a random assortment of Tie Fighter pilots on his little uh, Maxima A class heavy cruiser. Yeah. Um. So, you know, I, I'd certainly be willing to believe that the skill of the Rebel pilots is, uh, on average, higher than those of the Imperials, and at least or the First Order in this specific instance of course um, the first orders pilots have been trained since they were practically babies but i guess let's not get up hung up on the well, details we we they're the heroes you know. <laughs> well we don't know when they start getting like we don't know when they break off into their own little training groups like what what age do you think it's decided all right you guys want to be stormtroopers you guys want to be pilots i think as i mean i would imagine it would be pretty soon as soon as you can because, you know, if you think about all you need to do, basically, is, you know, basic, um, there really isn't much you have to do before you can break them off into different ones. And I'm sure they have some kind of advanced aptitude tests that test your, you know, motor skills and reflexes and things like that uh, pretty That's fairly true. early on. So I would imagine they would have them training from a young age, if not flying in actual pilots, at least, you know, sitting them in front of a uh, simulator for five hours a day or something. That's true. Who knows? Uh, you know. But like everything else, the first, those guys are the heroes. Yeah, there's, there's, so, you know what? That trumps yeah, all everything. We know else. so little about the First Order that it's, you know, just hard to comment on whatever they do at this point. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, you're right. Obviously, I, I think Poe's speaking hyperbolically. And remember, he's trying to bluff out Terex here yeah. at this point, try to psych him out. So, of course, he's going to be like, and I have a group of. Average to above average starfighter <laughs> pilots backing me up up top. That'll scare them. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but otherwise, I'm not sure I have much else this issue. Yeah, I think yeah, that's pretty much it. It. Uh, yeah. I, all I can say is that it does. It feels different. It feels bright. It feels you know. It feels more fun than as good as you know, like the Darth Vader issues are. It just feels different in a way. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you could almost say that about all Soleil's comics, because I think Lando definitely had a sense of fun. Even when it was dark, it was like kind of fun, you know, kind of breezy. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with Lando, the character. But then Anakin and Obi-Wan, I think, again, even when it's been heavy, has been, a, you know, a fun read as well. Mm. Um, Did Soleil so do props Anakin to... and Obi-Wan too? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So props to him there. Uh, it's all been quite delightful. Mm-hmm. All right, well, I guess that's going to do it for us today. Uh, as always, if you want to send us an email, you can do that at fasterandmoreintense at gmail.com. You can check us out on Facebook at facebook slash fasterandmoreintense. We are tweeting on Twitter at FMI Podcasting. We are on iTunes at Faster and More Intense Podcasting. And you can check out our YouTube channel at Faster and More Intense Podcasting. Star Wars is the exclusive trademark of Lucasfilm Limited. All Star Wars names and sounds are the exclusive copyright of Lucasfilm or parent company. All content generated on this site is the exclusive intellectual property of Faster and Intense.